they're registered and main roads does like the back end storing and collecting of hours for them. So then when it's time for that individual to recertify with DOE, they can just send a quick email. Eric Norgard will send you your accumulative hours and you send that right to our certification team. So it's so easy um, and it's incredibly streamlined. So sort of gone are the days of having to collect all of these certification hours and certificates and add them up and, and potentially lose track of them, et cetera. So it's another great benefit of being on the registry uh, at Main Roads, aside from it being required for our preschool staff. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. So Roy, I'm going to hand it over to you to just sort of walk us through what you offer uh, for both public pre-K educators, administrators, et cetera, in our state. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or facilitate anything in the chat box for you as it comes up. All right. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, Mr. Hockaday, I want to say that my my opinion is babies and pets are welcome anytime on virtual meetings. So it, it just warms my heart. Um, so uh, my name is Roy Fowler. I'm the acting director here at Maine Roads to Quality Professional Development Network. Uh, it is a partnership between Maine Roads to Quality and Maine After School Network, which is uh, part of the Catherine Cutler Institute at the University of Southern Maine and uh, also the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies at uh, University of Maine, Orono. Um, I've been in early childhood special ed for about 30 years, uh, and I was with CDS for about 12. Um, I was the director there for a little while. And um, so this is an issue that's really uh, close to my heart and, and obviously something that all of us have been watching very closely over the years. Um, and so through our contract with uh, Office of Child and Family Services, we support Maine's early care and education uh, programs to improve their quality, and also early care and education professionals with increasing their expertise. Um, and historically, we primarily uh, supported child care, but we're starting to um, uh, expand to work more with public school. And our experience and expertise, I think, could be beneficial um, given the potential private and public uh, partnerships that will be needed to support uh, the transition of FAPE for preschool age kids, as well as in the long-term goal, universal pre-K. Um, so I think most relevant to this conversation uh, are our trainings, our credentials, and our technical assistance offerings. And so now, uh, Main Roads Quality offers 48 trainings uh, it's a mix of on-demand and facilitated virtual. Uh, and there are several uh, that are related to inclusion, uh, including creating inclusive preschool settings, universal design, uh, supporting inclusion. Um, so uh, quite a few that are relevant to uh, what, what's going on. And the on-demand trainings are offered at no cost. And the ones that are facilitated, there's a, a nominal fee, no more than $35. Uh, and the one requirement is, as Nicole said, that you are a member of the registry. Uh, and the MRTQ registry link is right there in the chat. Um, and I'll be sharing some uh, pages here in a second. Um, let me share one screen here. One second. So, this is our training page, uh, and you can see the different tabs up top, so you can get to the registry here, uh, training, technical assistance, and credentials. Uh, our training page, uh, you can go to our online calendar, which will show you all of our upcoming facilitated training, uh, and we set, out, set that calendar at the start of every year. And right now we're scheduling trainings out for the full academic year. The on-demand trainings are available at any time. Uh, you would just need to go and let's see if this is going to move with me. Are you seeing the training calendar? Good. Um, so here you can find training, see a list here of our offerings that are coming up and being offered. So um, one other thing that is relevant is um, 
that we uh, also have an on-demand training. It's new. Uh, it's a six-hour on-demand training. Is it six or eight? For the preschool main early learning and development standards, they were just revised. It's a big collaborative effort uh, between a lot of different people at OCFS, DOE, Main Roads, um, several people. Uh, so uh, to get oriented to that tool, um, is that we have we developed an on-demand training so that um, people can just understand what it is, how you use it, um, and how it relates to uh, curriculum and assessment. And uh, we've also, uh, and Leanne might have brought this up, is we just uh, completed our third cohort for leading early learning, uh, which is primarily public school administrators who are interested in um, uh, implementing or uh, expanding their early childhood uh, offerings. Um, so, and it's been very well attended. It's very intensive. It runs over the course of the uh, academic year. Um, and I, I, we're gonna have a fourth cohort coming up here in the fall and, and looking forward to that. Then our credentials, um, I'm gonna share a screen again here. So this is our credential page and I'll just, and you can see the, the several credentials that we have. Um, the director credential is, is a good one. Uh, and then we have the inclusion credential and we expect to have a uh, preschool credential uh, ready to launch this fall too. The inclusion credential um, focuses on uh, three qualities of, uh, uh, three, three factors of uh, quality inclusive practices which include access, participation, and support. Earning the credential um, entails 84 hours of a mix of on-demand and facilitated training. And, uh, and then you have to have at least 480 hours of experience working with kids within the last five years, which shouldn't be hard for most of the people that are taking this. Um, and as I said, we'll be doing the uh, preschool uh, credential this fall, which folks might be interested in. The other thing, that we provide is technical assistance. Uh, and so we have several different kinds of technical assistance offerings. Uh, we have 10 district coordinators throughout the state who work with uh, programs to, to address quality uh, in our core knowledge areas, um, which, I, which I won't go into right now. Um, but they're available for on-site or virtual con, uh, consultation upon request. So if you reached out to main roads, uh, we could um, get on the phone with you, we could launch, uh, jump on a virtual meeting, or we can actually come to the program, to the classroom, to the school, and provide consultation there. Uh, we don't do child-specific, although we might do individualized uh, teaching practices. It's really about the quality and the developmentally uh, appropriateness of the program. Uh, so uh, we are... are very responsive, quickly respond, and, and we do everything we can to individualize our support to the strengths and needs of, of who we're working with. And several of those district coordinators um, have experience at CDS or special uh, purpose preschools that CDS contracts with. So there's a lot of um, special education uh, inclusion experience among this group uh, with evaluation, with, with teaching strategies, um, just the whole gamut. So very well qualified to provide that. We also offer communities of practice, um, which should be, I think it's on here. Uh, so community practices, uh, they tend to be virtual. Uh, sometimes they're in person uh, throughout the state and they can be for a variety of audiences. So it might be a family child care community practice or it might be a, a preschool uh, uh, community practice. Um, on a variety of things. And those are always open to anybody. Again, as long as you're a registry member, you can participate in those. And uh, coming up, uh, we also have book clubs occasionally, uh, text reviews. And uh, right now, and I'll get into this right now, is the inclusion initiative. I'll stop sharing this. So Maine uh, Roads to Quality Professional Development Network has been uh, working closely with Maine DOE and uh, the Office of Child and Family Services um, 
to implement the inc statewide inclusion initiative, uh, which is funded by the preschool development grant. Uh, we have, and I can send the information uh, out to this group after afterward. Uh, and what we're doing is we're supporting uh, four options that are available to anybody working with kids birth to third grade at no cost. The first one is a book club and uh, it's been very popular. It's on the book, Inclusion Includes Us. Um, and we have the same facilitators uh, facilitating each cohort because they, they expressed a desire to get better and better at this book club and, and presenting it. Um, and we have, I think a couple different cohorts coming up and again, I'll send out the information afterward. Uh, but if there is an increase in demand, um, we, we can open up another cohort for it too, um, to, to go through the book club. So depending on the demand, um, we, we can add offerings. Also part of the initiative is an on-demand inclusion training. It's inclusive education, uh, pre-K to 12. It's an on-demand training developed by the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies. Uh, you can also um, pursue a micro-credential, which includes that on-demand training, and then a one-day application day where you discuss about how are you going to apply these practices that you've learned uh, in the classroom setting. So that's the third option. And then the last one, I, I mentioned the inclusion credential earlier. We are going to have a cohort um, of uh, early career and education professionals move through all the related trainings for that credential together. There'll be opportunities to meet as a community of learners, um, check-ins. And so those trainings will run over the course of this academic year, and we expect it to be wrapped up by April. Uh, and at the end, uh, participants, um, if everything goes well, will have earned uh, that credential. Uh, that's mac the maximum of 20 participants in a cohort. So depending on demand, uh, that's another uh, offering that we can, we, can, we can add another one if the, if the demand is high. Um, because most of our offerings, uh, especially the facilitated ones, uh, can only handle 20 participants at a time, which is a drop in the bucket statewide. Uh, so we want to be responsive to, to needs. And, um, and as best as we can, we're going to accommodate the demand um, uh, just to help this whole process go as smoothly as possible. So that was fast. We do a whole lot in addition to that. Um, not relevant right now when I'm be drinking like uh, from a fire hose, so. Thank you, Roy. I'm thinking like, is there any of your coursework? I know that, you know, in our CDS run programs that our teachers, in order to get on the main star, um, the rising star. Rising, <laughs> rising stars star. for me, yes. Yeah, yes. thank you. <laughs> um, that they have to take a um, introductory course. What course is that? Um, they have to take uh, orientation to health and safety. Okay, orientation um, and to that, health and safety. So what uh, what Aaron is referring to is Rising Stars for Me, which is the state's quality rating and improvement system for early childhood programs. Uh, it was just revised uh, about a year and a half ago. It used to be quality for me. And the more stars you have, the better quality program you, you have. And, and that's dependent on components that your program has in place, as well as um, the experience and expertise of your staff. So the, if those components are in place and the experience and expertise of your staff is, is high enough, you move up in the star rating. Uh, and so they know about their main rising stars, even though I got the term wrong, because we have a minimum criteria. Of course, many of these SAUs have never worked with the child care before right. um, in terms of the provision of preschool education. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, and so they know that and they know what the minimum qualifications are. Is there anything that you can think of though, in terms of in the public school, is there any requirement, any main roads to quality requirement for teachers as they're working with these kids? Or is that just for childcare settings? Not that they're not like really beneficial and, and at some point, as we're doing this work, we wanna make sure that people understand really what all the course offerings are and what could support the provision of preschool education, special education in our schools. But I just didn't know if there was any like requirement for the uh, preschool certification or anything like that. I just wanna make sure. No, no, it's um, the Rising Stars really applies only to um, licensed programs. Okay. 
So, uh, you know, Nicole uh, used to do program approval for CDS, so she would visit all these programs and, and make sure that they checked all the boxes. Uh, but no, there wouldn't be a requirement. Um, one of the sticking points in the past for programs open up preschools is they had to adhere to local fire codes, et cetera, as well as, you know, all of the requirements from, from DOE. Um, and part of that was because of licensing. So I don't know if that still holds true. Um, but no, there's uh, to, to access um, our, our training. So the Rising Stars doesn't apply in, in the public school setting and, and unless something changes. Um, but even if it doesn't apply, those standards, those indicators are valuable to keep in mind because whether it's a, a private early care and education program or a public uh, preschool, there are a lot of, there are many more similarities than there are differences. Yeah. Well, and I really like that repository for a certification. And I think you should open that up globally to everyone. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's such get, a great deal though. Yeah, you can get so people, much. Yeah, they can print out the that. special development profile and they actually give that to certification and they certification takes that as evidence that you've done enough continuing ed um, to re-up your certification. Absolutely. For those of you who have teachers who, you know, would, I mean, that's free contact hours that you can just use to like build up your recertification and it's really quality programming. There's lots of agencies involved in preparing that programming. So definitely you want to tool around in that website and see what kinds of, um, you know, maybe you're struggling with inclusion and not understanding, you know, like whatever it is, I think there's a there's a training for that. Um, it's a really broad, comprehensive system. And we're going to probably include MRTQ, Maine Rose to Quality, in more of the work we're doing just so that they can understand how to support this initiative as well with any, maybe a training need becomes, oh, we become aware of a new training need given us new um, new instruction provided in public schools. So thank you for coming, Roy, and we'll probably be seeing more of you. Um, and thank you, Nicole, for joining us as well. Um, we're going to go into our general updates now. And so this meeting probably, unless you have um, a lot of questions about any of the things that we're talking about, this meeting will probably, will probably end a little bit early. So I'm going to add this to our, um, we've determined this. Most of you, I, I've been getting some questions about special purpose preschools and like ACAP, you know, how do we deal with the special purpose programs that are working with CDS and they have a way of working with CDS that in the past has been, let's just face it, very confusing. When I first got here, I was like, wait, what is happening over there? Because they are billing main care for half a day and CDS is paying for half a day. That's all um, been um, legislated out of reality, right? So right now we have a special purpose preschool daily rate, just like your special purpose schools. So you're all used to a special purpose school daily rate. But what is not, what pr these programs are not used to, and we're working with them to understand too, is that we're going to give them the daily rate or you are going to give them the daily rate and keep track of those payments because again as you know this bill legislates that you get 100 percent of the payment for these children you're going to pay them the daily rate and then they are going to bill main care on top of what you are paying them that happens currently for our k-12 students but it's very different for special purpose preschools because it's the first year they've ever had a daily rate and they're, um, you know, not sure about how this is going to work. So you pay them their daily rate and there's a daily rate sheet with published rates and then they're going to bill main care. And then at the end of that year, the BARB is going to do and that they're going to apply for the CARES package for that daily rate, just like what happens with special purpose schools. So what happens ultimately is that um, the costs of their program uh, the revenue from main care gets subtracted out of their costs and then a new daily rate is made. We are all used to this in special purpose land um, for K to 12, but I can tell you that um, 
CDS has never paid a daily rate and the special purpose private schools aren't quite accustomed to that. So they may be calling you and saying, we don't really understand how we're getting money for this and who's billing, are we billing main care directly? Who are we billing for what? And so we're working with them to understand that they're going to get a daily rate for you every day that you offer a program, not based on attendance, similar to the special purpose private school for K to 12. So um, I just want to make sure that was clear because it didn't sound clear to me. So I'm just going to check, Megan, is there, does that sound clear to you? Okay. Um, I, I guess here's what I would say. It sounds clear to me because I've been living in it as somebody who's kind of recently kind of come onto this. I suspect it's one of those things that makes sense to me because I've heard it multiple times. So it's one of those things that I benefit from repetition. Okay. I, I agree. Um, I, I, you guys are have a leg up because you've already been doing this and you're used to main care billing, um, them billing main care and then you getting charged for C. Go ahead, Mary Jo. Sorry, I, I did I raise my hand? If I did so, it was erroneous. I didn't mean to. Oh, okay. Well, nice to hear from you. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, one thing I will add, though, about the special purpose preschool is that you will not be paying seed for those children. You will not be paying seed. I want to make sure you know you are paying seed for K to 12 and beyond for your special purpose programs. You are not paying seed for special purpose preschools. You are only paying a daily rate. And then we're going to understand how much um, that cost is to you so that we can reimburse you for a high cost out of unit placement. Now, when you see the rates for special purpose preschools, they're not, they're not as much as the, um, typically as the um, K to 12. So you'll notice they're a little bit um, lower cost. And that could be because they have some childcare income coming in, because again, this is the first time they ever went through this program, the special, the CARES program, the CARES application, which you all have um, know about. So that is new for them. Last year we had um, a different payment method. So if you get confusing questions, if, if the special purpose preschools who have children in your catchment area are confused or ask you questions or don't understand, please let us know and we will work with that special purpose preschool to understand um, how they're going to move forward with this. And yes, no seed for you. All right, main care billing. Some of you are doing main care billing and, uh, and we want you to know that in order for us to assess your main care revenue for this age group, you must have a new service location. We've provided that information for you, but it will only be through a new service location in your SAU that will be able to extrapolate the appropriate amount of seed for the main care um, and make sure that we can we have already worked with um, the Office of Medicaid Main Care Services to kind of get a monthly report from them on the revenue that's coming in and, and so that we can make sure that no seed is charged to you. So if you need support with creating a new service center location, um, you can also contact us and we can um, help you with that. I'm doing that currently for CDS too. So it's happening everywhere. <laughs> um, and then I believe that um, I'm just gonna share the website and then I'll, I'll switch it over to Paula for the main ASBO meeting that we had and some follow-up that might be happening. So um, Susie Perry is our consultant and uh, as you know, working in this with us in Maine and helping support a lot of different things. And one thing she's done is create an outline of a website so that we have a very clear repository for all of the information that we are creating for these meetings that we've been having, such as the timeline for transition from C to B, such as um, we have documents for data collection, which we're going to be talking about potentially next week. And so we wanna make sure that you know that there is coming shortly <laughs> 
uh, coming very soon to the main DOE, there's going to be a website for early childhood special education that's going to have a repository of all the documents. And we, I know that Sandy, you're working on a Google doc folder, or maybe you aren't. No. I, I had started one for the communication letters. Okay. So the communication letters are in a Google doc. I'm sorry. I'm giving a thumbs up. Apparently I was doing that and didn't notice it. Um, so yes, the communication letters are there. Um, we will, uh, we could do a Google doc repository as well, but I think just having them on the website is going to be the easiest thing. Having a link on the website, understanding what the category is for the tool is going to be really crucial. And then of course, um, as SAUs are joining this work, they're going to be using the tools that we're creating now. So um, look forward to that in the next few weeks as well. And we'll get that to you. And then I will, I'm making sure that Paula is here. Paula, you're here. And you can provide the update on your meeting with Maine ASBO last week. Hello, everyone. A lot of information that we try to get into a very small amount of time. So I apologize for that, but we're we're doing the best we can to uh, learn ourselves and and uh, help you to learn at the same time while we figure this out to make it work best for all of us. So one of those things that we've done in order to help with that is we reached out to Maine ASBO to see about uh, having uh, meetings with the business manager, business manager members of Maine ASBO that are part of cohort one. And so we had a, our first meeting uh, last week, August 21st. And we, again, tried to put a lot of information into a short amount of time. Uh, but I think that it was uh, that it was a good meeting and there were some good questions asked uh, and some follow-up things that we are working on. And we will continue to try to partner with uh, business managers, especially in the um, formation of how we're going to be collecting the cost data to ensure that we are paying 100% of these costs for this program and that none of it is being filtered through the uh, state and local share because that, that would cause a problem. Yes, the ASBO meeting was recorded and Joanne, has a, has, Joanne Allen has a copy of that, I believe. Uh, and I can forward, if anyone wasn't there, uh, documents that were shared during that meeting. Um, one thing that did come up that is a question that we don't have an answer for yet, but we have a meeting scheduled next week with um, Maine PERS to talk about this is the match for the teacher retirement. So thank you for bringing up that question. Uh, and we are working on figuring out the answer. We will hopefully have that very soon, within a week or so. Um, and so that brings me to the ne my next point. Um, there's some things we don't realize that we aren't thinking of yet. So if there's something else that you think of that we haven't addressed, please let us know and we will <laughs> try to uh, figure it out as quickly as we can. That's the update. I'm unmuted, I'm unmuted now. Um, I'm going to adjust the office hours for the special services team to accommodate this meeting. This meeting, we had a, a, um, a kind of survey to see what would work best for people. And this is the time we came up with. So I'm going to change that meeting time for um, the special services office hours. Any other questions that we have? Yes, we will do any, we are doing individual meetings. We're still doing individual meetings. Um, and um, probably, you know, we can meet with you anytime you want. I mean, schedules allowing, um, but we probably will, you know, we wanna make sure that, um, you're making, you know, you're feeling confident and that you're making sure that you have all the things that you need. So we're gonna be continuing to touch base with you individually and in this group um, throughout the year again, because we want everything to go really smoothly for you. And we know that there's things that are coming up next week 
we are going to go through nine scenarios of um, different types of decisions that you might make for different types of programming for three, four, and five-year-olds. And so that's going to be really helpful for you to kind of see, we're just fine tuning that so that you can see like examples of what might happen in your SAU. And we're also going to break down um, how to treat the cost of um, the child who's attending outside of your catchment area and how that works. We're probably, we are um, using the ECETA model in for CDS, which is the early childhood education tuition agreement. And so we're using that model of what we do in CDS to support our understanding of how you would pay for childcare, at least a two, a two star quality rating this year. And then um, we'll be reviewing that as well. But I think the scenarios of what kinds of decisions IEP teams might make is going to be really helpful for you to kind of, and, and we're working on the understanding of that fiscally, the understanding of that procedurally, and how you you would communicate that to parents. So those things are, are going to be happening next week. We know that you guys are all starting school right now. If you need anything and it's kind of an emergency, we will accommodate what you need and go ahead and, and meet with you if you need that. Uh, Scott, go ahead. I know, I know you don't have an answer. I just want to, I'm still trying to I'm trying to figure out how much work and where we're at with the high cost in district model. Um, but I've done some so, different work Scott, with calculations and I'm not sure what we're doing. Scott, it's not yeah. gonna be a calculation. It's gonna be if the costs are higher than what we've allocated for funding for everything that we've given you, we are going to give you the difference. Okay, that's how we're gonna do the high cost. Okay, all right. That's because we have to cover 100%. And so, mm -hmm. and initially, we don't really know what these costs are going to be. This right. is the first year. Right. So we're really needing to collect a lot of data. From right. You. We need and so help. then, yeah. Oh, no, you'll get the data. I got it. Um, the, so uh, if you have costs now in the first quarter that already you, you believe wasn't covered in the first quarter allotment, which, by the way, hopefully everybody got by now, yeah. um, then you need to reach out uh, what we have started to do is for you to send documentation regarding these costs and the requirements in the in the IEP to be reviewed by the team here and then we will determine if if there's additional funding that you need now or if we can update later or what's going on on a case by case basis that's the best we can do okay that brings up another question you ready this I'm ready. one this one isn't going to you oh, good. Uh, <laughs> so Am I, when I, because I take kids from other districts into that program, am I billing those other districts or am I just including that in our overall cost that I submit to you? That's a great <laughs> question. It's okay. I knew you weren't going to have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that um, I would, I have an answer, but I think I have I'm an answer. Review it with the fiscal yeah. You have what? an answer, Paula. No. I do have an answer. So it, if 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 cohort one at your SAU yeah. has students that you are taking in into your program from other districts, yeah, you are cohort one, not them. We sh you should have given your we should have those numbers. We should be giving you funding for those students, mm -hmm. and you should have a superintendent agreement from the other district. Mm -hmm. So no, there would no be no billing to the other district. Okay, good. So you that, are receiving that, all the costs. Two, there's, for, yeah, there's been two different answers out there, so that's good. This is the right um, answer. But good. I'm going with that one. Okay. Uh, um, and then what came up from that? You, it was for me. You lied. <laughs> and I think. Um, yeah, well, we do, Elliot. And then my other question is, so and we got two situations going Keep here. Keep an eye on him. Yep. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> that's my boss. Isn't uh, two <laughs> questions the limit? For, you know? So my, we have two situations that are coming up. So in, in my self-contained program that we take kids from other districts, we have people in cohort one that send kids there, but we also have people who aren't in cohort one that send kids. Who's the LEA in that situation? You are, yes. superintendent agreement. Right. Yep. Okay. 
All right. Because CDS we would be cohort, we don't have placing the child in your that. program, right? Because they're not in cohort. That's the struggle, right? Is because I don't have. And right. So there's two situations. So that we hadn't thought of, Scott. However, no, I, and normally like like so what happens is CDS pays you for that child because it's not a superintendent agreement, right? Say that again. So, okay. So a CDS child is placed in your special purpose program. Correct. CDS child paid. And you charge CDS for that. If is that what's not, happening now? If they're not, a, we haven't started yet. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. In the past, we built CDS for the total program cost, but that's changed. Does, so now the, the, Oh, sorry. No. So my question, question. So I guess I'll just wait for a guy. I mean, there's just two situations. There's, there's schools that are in cohort one. That makes sense. Don't build them. We'll just take it to the cost. But then what do I do with the schools that aren't in cohort one? Do I build that to CDS? Does the child live in your boundaries? No, no, no. We're talking no. outside of catchment area. Okay. Yes. You yeah. would build your CDS. Cohort... No. Right? All right. We, we need to have a talk. <laughs> I know. We're, gonna, we're gonna talk yeah. this out because this is the first time that you're hey, opening up your and if program you, to CDS students. Yeah. And if you want if you want to have a talk and you need any of my experience, just send me a link and I'll I'll log in because I have done this before. But and there's different ideas that I have, but I don't want to give ideas that aren't gonna work. So that's um, well, thank you for that offer. We might take yeah. you up on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We hadn't we hadn't considered the um, out of cohort SAUs and that you are create, you are have a program that's offered to other children in the state and that is those children are the responsibility of CDS and any other catchment area outside of the cohort so we have to we have to get a clear answer for you okay and we will right. call you if we want and if to you need, and if you need help coming up with that answer I can meet with you so that's okay. fine um, that I think I've hit you with enough tough questions for today <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> every time we get a question though it makes us have to you know like come become well more clear I, yeah and don't response. think that doesn't happen to everybody i mean i had my three three a.m wake up the other day oh we got to get the toilet training question and the three-year-old questionnaire <laughs> you know i get it it's just <laughs> it's all stuff that's going to come up as we go so anyway thank you for answering that um and then actually we did have another question about the frequency of the DACE and the Patel assessments. Okay. The, um, Susie, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so um, at a minimum, we would need an entry and an exit. So the, between the, you know, the preschool, the child's preschool career, we mm -hmm. need those two scores. A best mm -hmm. practice would be that you would do it upon entrance to the program at the end of the school year yep. and then at the end of uh, prior to the child exiting the preschool special education program and going on to kindergarten. Okay. I don't and think we have any other rules requiring that annual score at this point, but um, at, at a minimum, an entry and an exit. Okay. And then my next question is, as I look at those assessments, there's a lot of sub, specifically in the Battelle, there's a lot of subtests. Does the preschool outcome measurement system require us to sub, do all those subtests or am I doing the screener or do we have there's guidance a, on that uh, yet? There's, uh, so both of those, there's the screener and, um, you know, a larger okay. test. Both of those have crosswalks through the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center that will align the items to the three outcome areas. And it okay. will tell you the item number that belongs under outcome one for social emotional, right. the, all the items that belong under knowledge and skills, et cetera. Okay, all right. And, and don't forget that we're gonna give you the kits and training on how to do these. We, we, we've got our kits and my school psychologist is ready to go and we got a plan. We just, with frequency was the frequency in which subtest was the questions. The federal yeah. reporting guidelines is entry and exit. So yeah. entry whenever they come and exit before they go to kindergarten. That would be the end of the school year before they go to kindergarten. Yeah, but it's and, going to be beneficial for you guys to have that and the, the medium assessment. assessment for data to show whether this is working or not, right? 
And the assessment needs to reflect the performance of the child. So we can't really dictate the methodology that yep. you use. I mean, yep. there is a way to do it without any of those assessments, you know, so yeah, that- Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, and, okay. Uh, so just, yeah. just need to make sure that it, you know, it's a reliable information. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. I am. And the longer it's been up, the more confused I've gotten. I hate <laughs> to say that. Now I'm confused about assessment because I thought the Patel, we were only giving once. Now you've talked about a screener for the Patel. We didn't purchase that, nor were we told to purchase it. I've got the Daisy. I've got the Patel. We're doing TS Gold in our regular because, again, we're a collaborative. So we were told within our collaborative, everybody needed a superintendent's agreement. Two of the districts are early adopters. Two of them are not. So do I need superintendent's agreements for the ones who aren't? Um, yes. Yeah. And then um, transportation reimbursement for these districts um, as well. Are we... Um, last year I was billing through CDS for like Dexter kids and they're not part of the collaborative. So am I still doing that? And it sounds like now they don't need superintendent's agreements, but we were told a couple of weeks ago to make yes, sure we do. have superintendent's agreements in yes, place. Yes, they do. We, okay. you, need, you need a superintendent agreement. If you are, if you have a student in your cohort from outside your resident SAU, you need a superintendent agreement. But we are yeah. also funding you for that student. You're not charging anyone. Okay. What about the transportation cost? Because that will be it's part us of the transporting. As well. that okay. It's not us transporting. Okay. One students. Okay. All right. So completely opposite of everything we did last year. Okay. Gotcha. Because um, it's a whole new yep. world. I just want to make sure, because it didn't sound like that's what was just said about to Scott about kids coming from outside of the cohort. It's supposed to be, but we need to regroup and get back to you all. We and do we, because and we started school today. I so know. these questions are coming at me hot and heavy. And I have parents who don't want to place their kids because they don't know the ins and the outs, you know, and some of these questions are the same ones I've been asking, honestly, since May. Um, my other just informational item, because I've run up against this, is as early adopters, I went to talk to my local Head Start about placing staff with their three-year-old. And I was told my staff couldn't work there because they didn't have a federal security check nor vaccinations. They've since dropped back on the not needing vaccinations, but I'm not gonna have their federal clearance for, you know, in writing for up to six weeks. And I went and got fingerprinted myself to help provide the service. And so, if I had known that anyone with that potential, I would have asked them to do that over the summer. So now I'm gonna to have to delay putting staff in my Head Start local program because it's a federal requirement. So if anybody else has Head Starts where their three and four year olds might be living. That, uh, I wasn't aware of that Sue. So thank yeah. you for bringing that attention. I'm sorry you had to learn that. Yeah, yeah I just, <laughs> I'm just letting you guys know. I mean, because for us, it's brand new. For some of you, you've been working with Head Starts or whatever. So maybe you knew. But for me, it was brand new learning last week. So I have a meeting with them ne next week. You know, as long as they have criminal history record check already on file and they go and get their fingerprints, will you please let us place an adult with that child, right? Pending the fingerprints actually clearing. I mean, for me, I have TSA and, you know, now I've been fingerprinted five times five different ways, but yeah. So they have to have federal, uh, it's DHHS license site, because when you get in there, there's different things to choose from. So you also need to know exactly which fingerprints and guess what? DHHS pays for those fingerprints. It is not an out of do. expense. Do. So that's also important to know like who's paying that bill. And if that's being I'll get off my high horse, but if that's being paid by someone other agency, it'd be nice if my staff were for their criminal history record check as well. But. So are you talking, I, I just want to clarify, because I've not heard that. I know that we have to have the DHHS fingerprinting and the CHRC. Um, are you saying there's an additional, and maybe Leanne or Nicole, you could speak to this? It, it was DHHS that they told me as a licensed facility. 
And I tried to do it as a provider and they told me it was, that was the wrong one to choose from the drop down. And I was able to just cancel and, and reaffirm there's an appendix C that has to go through this, the program director. And you have to check it off on the fact that the person had, um, was interviewed, had two letters of recommendation. Um, there's like five things. And one of them was vaccine. And honestly, that was the one that was giving me personally the hardest time. I said, you can see my arm. I've got proof of vaccine right there, <laughs> you know, which wasn't going to cut the mustard. I went to college. You needed proof to live in a dorm, but my doctor died in 1980. I don't have proof. <laughs> and, you know, it was go get a titer. Well, that's great, but you have to have a doctor's order to go get that. And then you have to make an appointment. So it was like this whole other rigmarole, but they have backed off on that. I don't know why, but they told me I didn't need that. And our staff working there did not need that. So Erin, so there are different regulations for DOE um, than DHHS has, and those are driven at the federal level. Um, and it is accurate that under DHHS for licensed childcare providers, that that is paid for for them when they um, go through the process and like how it is for folks going through the DOE side. I think that it would probably be helpful for us to reach to child care licensing to get some clarification um, on both the process so that we can make sure that the folks who need to go through that um, second wave of background check in order to be working in um, licensed provider sites, which would include Head Start, but also if you're working in any other licensed child care providers location, um, so that that's clear. And um, I think also getting a little bit of clarification about when it is absolutely essential, if there's an, a, and I, I don't want to misspeak on this, but I know it has come up in the past for us that um, if someone is going to be working in one of those licensed sites and they are going to be supervised by, um, let's say, a, a site director, when they absolutely have to have that clearance done and when, it, or if it's a, there's a difference if they're going to be working one-on-one -on -one with no other supervision around them. Um, because this has come up for us in public pre-K as well. But I think it's best initially to operate on the idea that you should just get the background check done. It makes it much, much easier. But we could certainly make connection with childcare licensing to get the process so that people know exactly what to select when they go through it. Does that make sense? I think what we have to do, Leanne, is get it written down and then right. so everybody knows it's real right. clear. That's what I'm, that's what yeah. I'm saying. I think yeah. we need to start with child care licensing to make sure that that's accurate, that what we're, what we're providing is accurate information. The problem is, is that there's a, D yeah, the problem is that we don't manage and oversee those. I myself got the DHHS certification, which is free for you. And, um, you know, just so that I could, you know, go into child cares and preschools. And I also have my CRHC. So, um, so yeah, I, but I don't know other than that, but we're going to work with Head Start and DHHS and make sure that we have a clear path forward. And Sue, all I can say is you're learning. I'm sorry that it happened like this, but it will benefit people in the future. So uh, we appreciate you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Erin. Just for us, I mean, my staff lives an hour away from being where they get fingerprinted. So I sent staff to get their CHRC. And now I have to send them back. And, you know, typically it's a half day of work that I'm also yeah. trying to coverage for. So, you know, I again, and you, I was told you can get back-to-back -back appointments. So it is something you can kind of do one and then roll and try and get that very next scheduled appointment people so if you're out there and you think you're gonna be placing folks highly recommend um i have it in the form but i can't i can't share it with you guys but i, I will send it to you aaron so you have what okay. they sent me and thank I you got what i got so it says exactly the the right drop down and i 
I verified with our local people it was the correct one. I mean, it's, it's a new world. This working with the age level is there's so many MRD. I mean, there's so many different things that are new learning for you and um, and it's a lot. And so again, you are, you know, paving the path for for the, the people who are coming behind you. And um, if there is more that we will now look in making sure that this is clarified for you. Um, and again, apologize for that inconvenience. Go ahead, Lou. Always helps to unmute, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, to my public school colleagues out there, uh, speaking of new learning, developmental delay, I've been on both sides of that in CDS and in public schools. Aaron, do we still primarily in CDS, are they using the Battelle for that determination? Um, I remember- They do use that. I think, yes, they use the Battelle. And I know that when I was last there five years ago, six years ago, uh, it had a lot to do. It was pretty straightforward, I thought. I mean, you either met the standard deviation or you didn't in two areas, or I think it was two standard deviations in one. I don't know if that's changed significantly, but it was pretty. No, it's it hasn't changed. And so <laughs> for those special ed directors out there, there's five areas of functioning that they look at on this test. And if you have two areas that are um, at least 1.5 standard deviations below the mean, then you qualify, or if you have one that's 2.0 2 standard deviations below the mean, then you can qualify. So that'll make sense only to the special ed directors out there, <laughs> but it will, uh, but it is, um, you know, in the five areas, it's, it's the same criteria as part C. I will tell you that happening in a parallel universe right now is that the part C eligibility, they are, the state is seeking to broaden it. But that is not true for the three to five year olds. And then, um, and then, as you all know, the special ed directors here know that um, I'm working to increase the age limits so that we don't have to have everything determined by the end of kindergarten. If it makes sense that we uh, need an instrument that is more sensitive, and you know, so. But that is um, definitely how you would get qualified for um, developmental delay. And just on the on the heel of that, the other two um, legs or arms, if you will, of eligibility, even with two lower scores that could qualify you, they still there still has to be some observable adverse effect, and there also has to be the requirement for special ed. That came up quite a few times in CDS because some kids at age four or three could score a little bit low on two areas, but we did not see an, an observable adverse effect anywhere. So. It gets hairy, but most special ed directors remember those three. Areas. Yeah, it's the three qualifiers, right? You have an adverse effect and you need instruction to access your program. So you can qualify with a disability, you can qualify for developmental lay, but if those two other factors aren't there, then you don't require special education. Yep. Yeah, so um, what is new is potentially your school psych staff giving a Patel, um, that that might be something that they haven't done before. Um, maybe they have, uh, and because there is, it is an adaptive tool and it looks at the five areas of, you know, I could name them all, but it's late in the day. Uh, but but um, yeah, we, uh, I think it'll be um, very easy for the special ed directors and the special ed staff to kind of understand how to interpret that and look at the, the three qualifying areas of adverse effect and construction. So, all right, we are at time. Thank you all very much. Can I just do coming. a quick closing real fast? I yes, we've heard a number of questions come up, and um, what you can expect from us is that we're going to put them into the parking lot. Um, questions that. Um, that are going to require kind of greater detail. We'll also provide some written uh, procedural uh, guidance, but the areas that we'll be addressing for, um, you know, in one way or another soon include uh, superintendent agreement clarification for uh, the different scenarios, 
um, Head Start and the federal fingerprinting and just some of those different um, uh, sort of situations that have been run into and sort of looking at child care licensing requirements, um, frequency uh, of assessment and some just greater clarity around screeners. Um, Su Susie gave us a quick overview of the minimum um, and then also sort of the best practice. And so some of that information will come. Um, also some greater clarity I heard was needed <clears throat> around uh, transportation. Um, and Sandy and um, Aaron and Susie, other members of the team, is there something else that I missed in terms of the rundown of what I was jotting down? No, I Sorry. just think we need to circle back and make sure we have some clarity on those. Very... We collect, yeah, we collected all the questions as, and um, you know we will review them and see whether or not we can add any of those to our scenarios things that we hadn't considered. So it's really helpful to hear from this group about things that they're encountering that we hadn't imagined. So appreciate your input. All right, everyone have a great afternoon and a great rest of your week and we'll see you soon. Bye.